You gotta like stay, I can't do it, man. Oh, 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 oh. yeah, that's how it works. So in the previous video, we were looking at the area of Burma and the emergence of this thing called the Konbang Dynasty. Now let's head over to the neighboring land, what is today Thailand. So if we could go back in time a few hundred years, this place that we today call Thailand was known to foreigners as Siam, and the people who lived there were referred to as Siamese. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, that name Siamese, it didn't really sit well with me. I had a neighbor who had this Siamese cat who was like, yeah, that dude was creepy, but um, you know, over time as I then learned about the, the kingdom of Siam and its history, yeah, now the word, I'm okay with it. I'm good, it works. So in the past, before the 20th century, this place that we refer to now as Thailand was known as Siam, and the people there, the Siamese, at least to foreigners. However, when we talk about this place, it gets a little confusing because now the people who live there are called Thai, the place is called Thailand, they speak a language called Thai, but then that language is part of a larger language family that's also called Thai. There's this language family that's called TAI Thai languages, and within that language family, there are various languages such as the Lao spoken in Laos, Shan, a language in what is today the Shan state of Burma. Uh, in around Chiang Mai, you've got what's called Northern Thai or Kham Mung. And then in the central part of what is now Thailand, they have what's called Central Thai, or what we often just refer to as Thai Thai, the language spoken by the Thai Thai people. That these different languages exist and that they're related means that they all must have come from some original homeland somewhere, and they did. Somewhere way back in the mist of time. Oh, man. Too misty, too much, too much. Okay, yeah, somewhere back in history, uh, there must have been a group of people who spoke a kind of proto-TAI Thai language. And many scholars believe that those people inhabited an area that's probably where modern Guangxi province is chi in China is today. However, of course, this was way back in time before there was any China, before there was definitely any Guangxi province. There were people living in that area who then migrated out of it into parts of Vietnam, Laos, what's now Thailand, Burma, even as far away as areas of what is today India. Whereas they did so, their languages developed separately, which is why we get these different languages today. So within the area of what is today Thailand, historically there were a few kingdoms that emerged, and they, uh, if you trace them, they kind of start in the north, not kind of, they do, they start in the north and then move southward. So you had a kingdom at Chiang Rai, Chiang Mai, Sukhothai, and then finally Ayutthaya, the kind of the big daddy of pre-modern Thai, T-H-A-I kingdoms. One of the things that's kind of far out if you visit any of the historical sites or the remains from these places is that you'll see that there's a big difference between the stuff that people built in the north and what they built in the central area around what is today Ayutthaya or Bangkok. In the north, in these early Thai kingdoms, you had people who built temples like these ones. Ayutthaya was established around 1350, I think. They started to build temples like these ones.
obviously there's some big changes that are going on there. And that's because when the earliest Thai kingdoms were formed up in areas around Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai, people had one kind of idea of how things should be done. But then as they migrated southward, they encountered lands where there were already inhabitants, peoples of uh, like Mon and Khmer peoples who had their own cultural world and the, as Thai peoples migrated southward into those areas, they created a kind of hybrid culture, which is why temples at places like Ayutthaya looked very different from the ones that had been built centuries earlier up in the north in areas like Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai. So Ayutthaya, like I said, this is the big daddy of pre-modern Thai or Siamese kingdoms. Formed in 1350, it was originally kind of a federation of these little kind of city-states or polities, but over time it gradually gained influence and, be, and became uh, a powerful center that controlled areas uh, around it. So like all kingdoms in pre-modern Southeast Asia and pretty much all kingdoms anywhere in the pre-modern world. Uh, the way things worked is you had a powerful capital, a powerful center, and then they didn't necessarily control things directly in the areas that they claimed to be their territory. Instead, they would have a local ruler who, who was there, who pledged allegiance to them, who paid tribute, and who you know, was officially recognized as part of the empire. And so this is the way that a place like um, Ayutthaya worked. It, would, it was, you know, the, Ayutthaya was the capital, but there were these outlying areas that were essentially like vassals that were, were within its sphere of influence. Very hierarchical world, and that hierarchy is something you would have seen all over the place. Um, at the top was the royal family, but then you also had nobility, and what made these people powerful was, like we've seen in other places, they controlled labor, they controlled people. Uh, how they did that was through various uh, kind of institutions of slavery or indebtedness of some kind. So there were people who were full out slaves, who were you know, maybe captured in war and who had to work for a member of the nobility or the royal family or maybe a temple forever. Then uh, there were people who were in kind of a, some form of debt bondage. So they, um, you know, they would work for some person. However, if they made money on the side, they can buy themselves out of debt and become a free person again. So, and this was something that was very fluid. There were people who say might go gambling. You know, lose big time, be in debt. They'd sell themselves into slavery to someone, uh, but then have time on the side to work, to make up the money, to repurchase their freedom, and, and you could move in and out like that. Being free, however, wasn't really free because um, even free people were obliged to provide labor to powerful people. And in particular, there'd be like a, a certain amount of time each year where free people would have to labor for someone who, uh, whose authority they were under, either a local ruler, a member of the nobility, a member of the royal family, a, a temple or something like that. So, very, very hierarchical society. A lot of it was centered around the control of people. And this is something that you would have seen in, you know, in the very, in the lifestyle out there, um, in the way that people behaved and the way they interacted with each other. So one thing you see when you go to Thailand today is this, it's called the why. It's a way of expressing respect towards another person when you greet them. If we could go back in time to old Ayutthaya, however, we'd find much more elaborate ways of greeting another person, and especially ways that show clear hierarchy. So uh, rather than the why, what you'd find is people doing something, I think they call it the grap, like this, you go down, much more graceful than me. Uh, then you go up like this, and I think you go down first, maybe, then you go up like that, and they would do that a few times. Uh, but then there was one that was even more intense than that. It's called the mop grap. It's like going all the way down. This is gonna kill me, man. I do not do yoga anymore. Uh, you go like this, then I think it's like this, and then they, there's something like, they go all the way, oh yeah, you gotta, you gotta like stay, I can't do it, man. Oh, oh. 
Oh, 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 yeah, that's how it works. Just this video clip shows it better. Let's watch this. Ông Yin Suryo Thai Phát Tháp Yulu, Ok Ya Sĩ Solin. Nung Bata Mong Yin Hai Lung Mong Phao Phaya Warat Bạn Thiếu Ni. Mi Yom Sadeet Lung Mong Phao Phaya Warat Phaya Khá. Mi Yom Sadeet Mong Lư. Lung Mong Phao Phaya Warat Bạn Thiếu Ni. Lung Mi Phát Sống Thì Chà Khao Phao Phaya Khá. ช้างเชือกนี้ข้าตั้งชื่อว่าพายทรงตะวันข้าของมันเพื่อนำมาเป็นของกำนันแด่องค์หญิงส่วนไปกับหลายประเทศอื่นๆในเอเชีย Ayutthaya was a place where controlling people was the name of the game. That's where power came from. And, you know, that hierarchy in the society helped keep that everything into place or everyone into place. So it was uh, in that way, like a lot of other places in the region. Another thing we would have found similar is the main capital was a remarkable place. Ayutthaya was built at a place where three rivers come together and then they dug a canal at another part to create a kind of island where they built the the main city center with palaces, lots of Buddhist temples, and there were big congregations there of foreign traders, people from all over the place, uh, from Java, Champa, um, India, and uh, then the, the Middle East, you had people coming eventually from Europe, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the British, uh, you know, Chinese, of course, all kinds of people coming there and trading with the place um, and prospering. So anytime you get a place that's prosperous like that, you're gonna get people who want a little of that prosperity. And that's exactly what happened in 1767 when the neighboring kingdom of Burma under the Kongbang dynasty attacked Ayutthaya and destroyed it, hauling off lots of its population um, and wealth uh, in terms of like gold and things like that. So in 1767, this kingdom that had existed for a few hundred years was basically destroyed. But from the ashes of that destroyed kingdom, a new kingdom emerged, and that's what we're gonna check out in the next video.